It's a joy to be with you this morning. You know, as you know, the Lord in the natural world, in animals, in nature, instilled a lot of spiritual truths, theological truths, if you will. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 29 it says, when he gave the sea, I'm sorry, let me go back there. When he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep, or if, depending on the translation that you're reading from, it may say would not trespass his command. Companion passage to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 29 is found in the passage that Daniel read for us just a few moments ago, and I'd like to direct your thoughts back there here for a moment. Job chapter 38, particularly verses 8 through 11. Uh, you may remember this is this litany of questions that uh, God is asking Job, knowing he does not have the answer for them. Remember, Job and his friends have spent the previous 37 chapters um, trying to make sense of everything that has happened to Job, and there's been a lot of wrong theology that has come out from those conversations. And so God has finally heard enough, and you remember uh, those last few chapters of Job, he just one right after another, these series of very powerful rhetorical questions, and, and Job and his friends are just sitting back, I mean, just in awe of, of God's voice and the things that he's saying. Well, included in uh, these questions, in these statements from nature uh, that God makes reference to, he says this, beginning in verse 8 of Job chapter 38, or who shut in the sea with doors? When it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. And so in nature, we can look at the oceans of the world and we can learn by observation that respecting God's boundaries are important. And that's what we're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about this morning. I'm so thankful that God put boundaries on the ocean. And isn't it bad news when, and we know, of course, we live in a fallen creation, and there are occasions when the Lord allows, because we live in a fallen world, just in the same way that we can be aware of God's commands and at times violate or trespass them. There's sometimes the Lord, whether it be because of a tsunami or a hurricane, he allows uh, the ocean waters to violate the commands that he's put in place and what always happens when the ocean violates or trespasses the commands or the boundaries that God has put in place for them. Catastrophic damage, right? We learn from the natural world how important it is to respect God's boundaries and I'm so thankful in particular when it comes to the oceans of the world that God put those boundaries in place. I'm not real crazy about the ocean. My wife loves the ocean. I, I have never been more than a couple of hundred feet out into the ocean waters, and that is only because my wife has um, tempted me and goaded me to go out there with her, uh, and I have succumbed to negative peer pressure and gone out there with her on occasion. I'm not a big fan of the ocean. There's stuff in there that wants to eat us, okay? <laughs> Um, and is very indiscriminate uh, in, in whether they choose to eat us or not. Uh, I, don't, you know, I just really don't like going out there. So I love knowing that the ocean has boundaries and limits. You know, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And that is not even beginning to speak to the volume of water. You know that less than 5% of the water on the face of the Earth is fresh water. So I want you to think about all of the rivers, the lakes, the streams, all of the freshwater bodies on the face of the earth comprises less than 5% of the world's water. That means those four oceans contain 95%, a little bit more, of the world's water. So aren't we thankful that the Lord has put boundaries on those oceans? You realize, I read somewhere, I think this was from a, um, a government website that gave facts about the water on the earth. They said if you could take the water that's in the oceans and pour that water on top of the United States, that it would bury the continental U.S. to a depth of 107 miles. There are places in the ocean that are so deep, in particular the Challenger Deep is the name of a place in the West Pacific, west of the island of Guam, 
where it is so deep that you could take Mount Everest and you could drop it into the Challenger Deep and it would still be the top of Mount Everest a mile below the surface of the water. The Challenger Deep is 36,000 feet deep. And so aren't we glad that the Lord put boundaries, that he set doors, that he set gates on the waters of the oceans. These guys that are catching this righteous wave right here that are hanging tin, <laughs> do you know why they're so bold in riding this wave? Because they know this wave is going to stop when it gets to the shore. Because God has put boundaries and limitations on how far inland that wave, under normal circumstances, if they thought there was a chance that that wave was going to toss them into a side of a condominium because it just kept right on going, do you think they'd be riding it as confidently as they're riding it right now? So we have these boundaries that are set in place. God is teaching us in the natural world that boundaries are important and overstepping those boundaries, going outside of those boundaries. When the ocean decides, under the influence of a hurricane, a tsunami, a storm, when it decides to trespass God's command and go against the boundaries that are put in place, there's nothing but catastrophic damage that takes place after that. The same is true in our spiritual lives. When we overstep the boundaries that God has put in place for us, there is nothing but danger, catastrophic damage that takes place when we overstep God's boundaries. He's, he has put boundaries in place for our protection, for our benefit. And we see over and over again in Scripture how important boundaries, borders are to God. Joshua chapters 13 through 19. That is... That is almost a third of the book of Joshua. After they have conquered the land, before they began inhabiting the land, God told them what their borders were going to be, both nationally and tribally. So they were told exactly how far they were going to be allowed to inhabit the promised land, the land of Canaan, to the north, the south, the east, and the west from a national standpoint. But also within those national boundaries, God gave the people their tribal boundaries. So when they came into the promised land, he did not just turn them loose and say, okay, first come, first serve. Y'all just, just go and inhabit whatever part of this promised land you want. Can you imagine what kind of chaos would have ensued if God had not already put those boundaries in place for those tribes before they inherited the land? Why is this of any importance to us? God does not have... Um, a special relationship with that land today in the way that he had back then. In fact, I don't even know. Brother Chair, you, you could tell me, do they even recognize these tribal boundaries anymore? There's no significance in present-day Israel uh, to these tribal boundaries that are given to us in great detail in Joshua chapters 13 through 19. But yet you have almost a third of this book that is dedicated to providing for us the information regarding these boundaries, boundaries that don't even exist today, Boundaries that, that are not even acknowledged by those who inhabit the land this very day. So why? God in his infinite wisdom, why did he put for us a significant portion of this great book of the Old Testament uh, detailing for us boundaries and borders that don't even exist, have no physical or spiritual significance to us today? I think in part, God is trying to teach us boundaries are important to him, most importantly, from a spiritual perspective, but even to this very day, the reason why nations have boundaries, the reason why, and I, I'm not trying to get into a political debate or discussion this morning, but I think what we need to understand when we start thinking about borders and boundaries and walls and these kinds of things, they exist because God designed them to be so. We have the borders that we have in this country, north, south, east, and west, because they are in accordance with God's design, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, where Paul says to the Athenians that he was speaking to on that occasion, he marked out the nation's appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. But most importantly, what I want us to spend some time talking about this morning is spiritual boundaries. God has put these things in nature for us to be able to observe and for us to be able to conclude that boundaries, borders, are important to God because of the protection that they provide, especially from a spiritual standpoint. Jackson, if you could advance that next slide for us. 
1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, I want us to consider a few passages together in light of this idea of operating within God's boundaries. I'm sorry, did I say Jack? That's just Jared and, and um, up there helping us this morning. 1 John chapter 5, and verse, verse 2 and 3 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Now, I want us to think about a passage like this in light of this idea of respecting God's boundaries. When God gives us commands, what are those commands at their very essence? It is God providing for us parameters in which we are to exist, spiritually speaking. He's providing for us borders. He is providing for us boundaries. He is wanting us to operate in our spiritual life within the confines of the boundaries, spiritually speaking, that he has put in place for us. They are there not to um, inhibit us, not to rob from us joy, not to take from us the opportunity to live the abundant life. He puts them in place and wants us to operate within them so that we can have an abundant life. So we can avoid those catastrophic situations that so many find themselves in when they operate outside of the spiritual boundaries that God has put in place for us. Look with me in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. I want us to consider this passage in light of um, in light of our discussion this morning. The law of the Lord is perfect. I want us to think about, when you think about these words like law, statutes, commandments, these words we're going to look at in this passage, think about it in terms of God's boundaries. The law of the Lord, his boundaries are perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, his boundaries are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, his boundaries, his spiritual borders are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they than gold, yea, than much gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, by these boundaries, these commandments, these laws, these testimonies, just look at them as boundaries that God has put in place for us. By them, the servant is warned. In other words, don't go beyond them. Don't go outside of them. They are perfect. They provide security. They provide peace. They provide safety, spiritually speaking. So moreover, by them, your servant is warned, in keeping of them, there is great reward. There's such a benefit that comes within respecting God's boundaries. When we think of a refuge, when we think of a fortress, do we think of some wide open, unsecure space? Or do we think of a, about a place that is tightly secured, that has specific boundaries and borders put in place, Look at the way a relationship with God is constantly referred to, particularly in the Old Testament, as a place of refuge, as a place of safety, as a place that is a fortress for our heart and for our soul. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. In other words, the righteous is someone who appreciates, acknowledges God's protective boundaries, the protective borders that he has put in place. Proverbs 14 and verse 26, In the fear of the Lord, their strong confidence in his children will have a place of refuge. This is a place of safety. Psalm 71 and verse 3, Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Over and over again, God is trying to paint this picture for us. Stay within the protective area that I have provided for you. Stay where it is safe, spiritually speaking. This is what Jesus was lamenting when he cried over Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23. And in that cry and that declaration of of what was coming, the Lord says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Jesus is saying, Jerusalem, I wanted to provide for you a hedge of protection. 
I wanted to create for you safe boundaries and borders and for you to exist in them, for you to be under my protective hand. Jesus wanted so badly to be able to provide that for Jerusalem, but they were unwilling because so many times human beings do not like boundaries. So many of us struggle with boundaries. It's why we have so many things in our vernacular that we have. So many, uh, maybe some of you liked the show Star Trek. What was one of the things in the introductory song or the introduction to the show, Go Where No Man Has Gone Before? Have you ever heard someone say, I was motivated to do something because somebody told me I could not do it? Have you ever heard somebody say, don't tell me what I can or can't do. Don't you try to put boundaries around me. Don't you try to put limitations around me. Michael Jordan, in his Hall of Fame acceptance speech, he had had an insanely successful college basketball career, an insanely successful NBA career, had won six NBA championships, and now he's being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And even in his Hall of Fame speech, he referred back to his ninth or 10th grade high school college coach who did not let him be on the team because he didn't think he was good enough. And so all those things that Michael Jordan accomplished, and yet he was still thinking about so much so that he made a reference to somebody who told him, you can't do something. We as human beings don't like boundaries, limitations. You, we have phrases like pushing the envelope and thinking outside the box, and these are fine in certain circumstances. When we're talking about growing a business or achieving something uh, that is you know, not immoral, there's no problem with trying to exceed boundaries and borders and limitations in certain circumstances, but not when we're talking about God's boundaries. We have no right, even though we may be tempted to do so, we have no right to exceed the boundaries that God has put for us in our lives. Matthew chapter 25, you remember very well, Jesus paints for us the picture of the day of judgment. And he uses to illustrate that occasion, that scene, by saying that there will be a separation that will take place in a way as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And you remember the sheep are depicted as those who will be saved. The goats will be depicted as those who will be lost. Again, God puts a lot of lessons for us in the natural world. He, he puts lessons for us, theological lessons, spiritual lessons in the oceans of the world. Sometimes he puts theological, spiritual lessons for us in the animal world. And I think there's a reason why God chose sheep to represent those who would be saved on Judgment Day and goats to represent those who would be lost. Because one thing that I learned at an early age when I was, um, my first job was, taking care of some goats that the person who owned the pecan orchard behind our house kept out there to keep the underbrush clear um, below the pecan trees. Goats do not respect boundaries. I could have taken back, you know, if I had lived during the day where you took a picture of every single thing you did, I could have taken this very picture every single day when I went out to check on those goats. Every single day. There was one or more goats with their head stuck through the fence trying to get to something that was on the other side of the fence that was put in place for their protection. Every day, a goat has had its head. This, this picture came from a blog that a woman was writing, and this particular goat, this very goat, she says she has to get his head stuck from the fence over five times a day. And, and there was another picture when you read the blog, this beautiful green pasture right behind the goat where all the other goats were enjoying eating from. And yet this, this one always thought, man, there's just something on the other side of this boundary that's way better than what I've got in here. Alice, I was not able to get the picture loaded. I'm going to go, I told Alice and Jeff I was going to tell on a couple of their goats this morning. And that is what I'm going to do. Right now, I don't have a picture to share with you, but uh, Wendy was helping feed the Tanner's animals while they were out of town a week or so ago, and on multiple occasions in going to their home to tend to their animals, there were multiple goats who were not inside the nice 
fenced in area that Jeff has built for them. Cody, did you help build that? Alyssa. This nice fenced in area, they've got all the food they could possibly need in there, and yet every day, almost, I think, when he came in, I was an eyewitness on one occasion, come out there, there's goats outside of the pen, eating in places where they're not supposed to be. Ironically, <laughs> Alice told me that one particular one that was out every day, they've named him Zerubbabel. And I thought, you know, for a goat that disobedient, uh, a more fitting name would probably be San Ballard or Tobiah. Okay, and that's some Old Testament humor right there for you. Um, but that it might be a better name for a goat that disobedient, who is so disrespectful of the tanner's boundaries. Goats do not respect boundaries. And I think by design, that's one of the reasons why God uses that animal to depict those who will be lost in the day of judgment. Because goats, maybe unlike any other animal out there, they do not like boundaries. And if they find out some way to get on the other side or to breach those boundaries, they will. This goat breaches the boundaries five times a day gets his head stuck every single time. And if you see this picture, he's learned to stick his head. This is how willful, according to the blog, this goat is. The goat has learned to stick its head through the fence low enough so that if it takes a while for somebody to get it out, it can just lean down on its front two legs. Do you see where it's just, it's now in a resting position on its front two legs because it knows, hey, if I'm gonna be stuck here for a while, at least I can get a little comfortable. And so this goat has learned that if I get my head through here, I'm not getting it back out again on my own, and I may be here for a while, so when I stick my head through and breach the boundary, I at least need to be in a situation where I can rest for a little while. God's boundaries can be found everywhere. We don't have the time this morning to cover all the different ways that we find boundaries in Scripture, but just a couple that I want to share with you this morning that are so important. God's boundaries can be found around the marriage relationship and how we as a society are showing such a lack of respect for the boundaries that God has put in place. Jesus was asked about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in Matthew chapter 19, and he takes those who asked them back to the very beginning. Instead of the very beginning, when God made them, he made them male and female. So God says at the very beginning, he placed boundaries around the marital relationship that it is confined to one man and one woman. That, those are the boundaries that have been put in place. And yet, what are we being told in our society today? That those boundaries mean nothing. And we have had, now had laws passed. There are now laws of the land that are in the books where two men can choose to enter into the marriage relationship, two women can choose to enter into the marriage relationship. We're now seeing there are movements that are being put in place now, and I think we're going to continue to see continual assaults where now you're going to, it's not just going to be two individuals regardless of gender, but there's going to be multiple individuals. Now one or two of one gender, one or two of another, two or three, because the borders are not respected, we're seeing all kinds of corruptions of the covenant that God has put in place, the boundaries that he has put in place. God has put boundaries in place around those with whom we closely fellowship. And I'm not talking about not being salt and light and not being an influencing agent into the world, but God has put stipulations in place for us regarding those who we enter into close, intimate relationships with, those that we spend our social time with, those that we spend our quality time with. What does he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 11? But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Here is God putting in place boundaries as far as our personal relationships are concerned. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. God is putting boundaries in place as far as our interpersonal relationships are concerned. Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So God has put 
boundaries, borders around those with whom we closely fellowship. And he has put boundaries and borders around our heart. Note with me Proverbs chapter 4. Sorry, let me back back up to the previous slide. I don't have this on the screen. If you would like to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4, I'd like for us to consider as we close our thoughts this morning, verses 23 through 27. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. I want us to consider the words of these passages in light of our topic this morning concerning these boundaries, this, these borders, spiritually speaking, that God wants us to operate within. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. So, in essence, put boundaries around your heart, put boundaries around your speech. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Put boundaries, put barriers, spiritually seek, speaking around your eyes. Verse 26, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Put boundaries and borders, speech, spiritually speaking, around the steps that you take around your feet. Do not turn to the right or the left, remove your foot from evil. Why? Why is God so concerned about boundaries? And as we close this morning, I want us to take us back to that imagery that we considered for a moment at the beginning. What happens? We've seen it. In our part of the country just this year, we have seen the catastrophic damage that happens when the ocean waters violate the commands of God. When they overstep their boundaries, there is nothing but harm, disaster, damage that takes place. And spiritually speaking, it's the exact same way. When we allow our words, when we allow our eyes, when we allow our feet, when we allow our heart to go beyond the boundaries that God has asked us to operate within, what happens? What does our mouth do when it breaches the boundaries that God wants us to stay within? Where do our eyes go? Where do our feet go? Where does our heart go? When we allow ourselves to exceed the boundaries that God has put in place. There's nothing but harm, but damage, but destruction that comes on the other side of those boundaries that God wants us to operate within. Why, are, why do the boundaries exist? Because God wants to limit us, hinder us, rob us of our joy. The exact opposite. True freedom, true joy, true peace can only be found in staying within the fortress, staying within the boundaries that God has put in place for our lives, for our heart, for our eyes, for our feet, for our hands. If you're not a child of God this morning, then I want to implore you to accept the Lord's invitation by faith, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. You can be baptized into Christ this morning. Have your sins washed away. Come out of that water, new creation. As Paul says in his Roman letter, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, come out of that water, buried with Christ by baptism, coming out a new creation, ready to walk in newness of life. If you've done that, but you have spent some time operating outside of God's boundaries. Maybe the decision that you can make to come back into his protective arms, that's a decision you can make just in your mind and in your heart with the Lord. Or maybe you want the prayers and encouragement of your brethren in Christ. We'd love to pray with and for you right now as together we stand and sing.